The 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for experiments demonstrating that quantum mechanics exhibits Bell violations. And after that was announced, commentators came to try to explain exactly what that's supposed to mean, and unfortunately it became engaged in a game of telephone, where the original statements were that quantum mechanics disproves the notion of local causality, that then turned into local realism, then realism, which then morphed into quantum mechanics shows that the universe isn't real, and then finally, we live in a simulation. This isn't really anyone's fault. Different physicists will use the same term in different ways, or they might start with different assumptions in order to reach the same conclusion. My goal here uh, is to contribute to the conversation in two different ways. The first is to strictly define what these terms mean in a quantum mechanics context. And the second is to go through what I think, and hopefully you will agree, is the cleanest proof that quantum mechanics cannot be locally real. Locality has a simple and experimentally verifiable definition that no object can move faster than the speed of light. It's also important to note that the concept of locality uh, vastly predates Einstein and the theory of special relativity. Newton himself said that it is inconceivable that inanimate matter should, without the mediation of something else, affect other matter without mutual contact. Here, Newton isn't so much distressing that uh, gravity is infinitely fast, so much as there, that there is no physical mechanism mediating it between objects. This related concept is called no action at a distance, which means that objects which interact need to do so through some physical signal that travels through space. That is, the moon uh, cannot simply just know where the Earth is. The Earth needs to send out some physical object to the moon, such as a gravity wave, in order to induce that interaction. But this also means that, in principle, this physical signal should be possible to pick up with a detector. To say that quantum mechanics is non-local is not just to say that the interactions are occurring faster than light, but it's also to say that there is no physical object being transmitted between the particles to begin with. Realism is the philosophical position that states that the universe exists independent of one's perceptions. While this is an interesting question, it's a bit too uh, metaphysical to be tested by experimental means. When people talk about realism in a quantum mechanics context, what they're really referring to is the notion of value definiteness, which is that uh, quantum properties exist regardless of whether or not they were measured or if they even can be measured. When I step on a scale and it reads 150 pounds, if you assume a value definiteness, then that means that my weight was 150 before I stepped on that scale. To reject that idea is to say that I was imbued with that weight of 150 pounds only at the moment that I stepped on the measuring apparatus. So classical physics is a shorthand for a theory that is both local and value definite. So consider a device known as a Stern-Gerlach apparatus. The way that it works is that it's oriented in one particular direction, and when you place an electron into it, the electron will deflect either in that same direction or in the opposite way. The direction in which the electron deflects is called the electron spin, and the state is written as a times spin up plus b times spin down, where a squared is the probability it would deflect upwards, and b squared is the probability it would deflect downwards. Note that spin up does not mean that it's deflecting literally toward the ceiling, but that it's deflecting in the same direction as the detector and spin down likewise means that it deflects in the opposite direction of the detector. But wait, you say, if that's the case, then there's no difference between a plus b and a minus b. If you're squaring the numbers, then the probabilities end up being the same, right? 
And the answer is that yes, these states are indistinguishable when the detector is pointed in the plus Z direction, but if the detector was pointed, for example, in the plus X direction, then they would be different. In particular, what we see is that the plus state will deflect to the right 100% of the time, and the minus state will deflect to the left 100% of the time. So it turns out that up Z plus down Z is the same state as up X. Crucially, the minus sign doesn't make any difference if we're doing all the measurements in the Z direction, but it is a way of encoding information about how the state differs when the apparatus is pointing in a different orientation. And so likewise, we can also ask how to encode up and down in the Y orientation in terms of Z. And in order to do that, we can use uh, imaginary numbers, where up Y is equal to up Z plus I times down Z. And it's important to note here that we don't need to assign any literal physical significance to the usage of the imaginary number. It's more of just a convenient mathematical device. Now we have these relations of x's and y's in terms of z, but looking forward, we're actually going to want the reverse, where we want to rewrite the z's in terms of x's and y's. So in the 1920s and through into the 1960s, a debate raged in the quantum mechanics community on whether uh, the probabilities were an inherent part of the physics or if they demonstrated a lack of knowledge on our part. People like Albert Einstein and David Bohm believed that quantum mechanics was an incomplete theory and that uh, we were missing some type of hidden variable that if we knew it, if we could somehow determine it, would allow us to predict with uh, certainty uh, which way the electron would deflect. But on the other hand, uh, people like John von Neumann and Niels Bohr believed that quantum mechanics was inherently random, that uh, there was no hidden variable, that there was no uh, information that we didn't know, but rather that the information simply did not exist. So now we come to 1964, when John Bell enters the picture, and he considers a two-particle state of up-up minus down-down which means that you have two electrons, and when you put them through uh, two detectors, each oriented in the Z direction, they're both either going to deflect upward or downward. And again, I repeat, the minus sign is there to encode information on what, on what happens if the detectors are not necessarily both pointed in the Z direction. And what John Bell showed is that any classical theory of physics needs to obey this very particular a statistical relationship, and what he went on to prove mathematically, and which was later confirmed experimentally, is that quantum mechanics violates this statistical relation. So I'm not going to go through Bell's theorem for two reasons. The first is that uh, there's a lot of great content on it on YouTube, and I feel like I would just be repeating what others have already said. But also, his method was not completely intuitive. Uh, it requires you to consider thousands of pairs of electrons and see that the numbers don't quite add up, but it can be hard to pinpoint exactly where the contradiction is. A much better proof was given by Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger in 1989 and which was then improved by David Merman in 1990. Just by adding one uh, single particle to Bell's previous state, they managed to transform the proof from being a statistical relation to one that is fully demonstrative. By construction, the GHZ state tells us that when all the detectors are oriented in the Z direction, then the three particles will deflect either all up or all down. But now let's consider what happens if the three detectors are all oriented in the x direction. We found out how to write up z and down z in terms of the x's, so now we can just plug in, multiply out, combine like terms, uh, cancel, and see how the state behaves 
in the XXX orientation. So this is now a little bit more complicated. There are four possible outcomes. Either all three of them are going to deflect downward, or one of them is going to deflect downward, and the other two will deflect upward. These four states have something in common. Uh, take, for example, the result of particle A in the x direction. We'll say that if it deflects upward, then uh, we can assign it plus one. And if it deflects downward, then we'll assign it minus one. And note that for all four of these possible outcomes, the product of AX times BX times CX must always be negative one. This was our first equation. Uh, to get our second equation, let's now change the orientation of the detectors, where particle A is still being measured in X, but now particles B and C are going to be measured in Y. So same as before, uh, we know how to write the Z's in terms of the Y's. So we plug in, multiply out, cancel and combine like terms, and now what we can see is that this is the opposite of the triple X orientation, where now either all three particles will deflect upward, or uh, one will deflect upward and the other two will deflect down. To get our second equation, consider the product of AX times BY times CY. Uh, see here that you're either multiplying three positive numbers or one positive times two negatives. So for all four of these cases, you're going to get plus one. For our third equation, we're going to measure particle B in the X direction and the other two in the Y. But we don't need to repeat our mathematics here, because A and B are completely symmetric, and therefore they are going to deflect in the same way. So here we get AY times BX times CY is also equal to plus 1. And using that same logic, for our fourth equation, we're going to find that AY times BY times CX is equal to plus 1. Let's bring back the first equation from earlier, and these are the predictions that the math of quantum mechanics makes uh, for how the GHZ state is going to deflect given these orientations. And sure enough, this is exactly what we see in experiments, that all XXX uh, experiments will have a result of negative one, all XYY orientations will have a result of positive one, and so on. Let's review our original assumptions. We assume locality when we put particles A and B, for example, so far apart, that no signal from A can reach B in time. So because of that, particle B, uh, its result cannot depend on anything that happened at the location of A. Value definiteness is a little bit more tricky. Here we have a system of equations, each of which is individually verified, uh, but uh, there are six uh, possible variables, and you can't measure all of them in a single experiment. So even if you are doing the XXX measurement, uh, if you assume value definiteness, then that would mean that you're assuming that the value of AY uh, is defined even if you don't know what it is, even if you never find out what it is. So that was a lot of exposition, but now let's get to the punchline. We have uh, four equations, each of which we know is individually true, and we want to solve them all simultaneously. Each of these variables can only take on the values of plus one and minus one, and we know that the first equation has to multiply out to negative one, so let's just assume that AX, BX, and CX are all negative 1 and see what happens. To make equation 2 work out, that means that one of the uh, variables has to be negative and the other has to be positive. So let's just say that BY is the negative 1 
and CY is the positive one. And now, uh-oh, uh it looks like we've reached the contradiction, where according to equation 3, AY has to be negative, but in equation 4, AY has to be positive. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So that original assumption of uh, AX, BX, and CX all being negative didn't work out, but that's that's fine, that's fine. We, we still have another option. We can say that one of them, let's say AX, is negative one, and the other two are positive. And this has to work, because this is the only option we have left. Uh, but let's go through it, as, like good physicists, and just make sure. Same as before, equation 2 says that one of the variables has to be negative, so let's say that's by, and the other variable has to be positive, so let's say that's cy. And so now we can see that equation 3 says that ay has to be positive 1, and equation 4 says that ay has to be negative 1. Oh, shit. So we've reached an impossible contradiction here, that even though each of these equations is individually true, they can't be solved simultaneously. So as far as we can see, there are only a few options. First is that quantum mechanics is non-local, and signals can be uh, transmitted faster than the speed of light, and or quantum mechanics is value indefinite. In order to speak reasonably, of the value a y, it must have been measured. Before measurement, there is no such thing to even speak of. But there is a third option, and I didn't bring it up earlier because it's not very popular, but there are some legitimate physicists, like Gerard et Oft and Sabina Hassenfelder, who do believe in this. This option is called superdeterminism, and it's the claim that, no, yeah, there are GHZ states that, when measured in the xxx direction, would totally give a value of plus one. But, by some unknown cosmic principle, uh, for some reason, whenever we could get a value of plus one by measuring xxx, then we end up measuring xyy instead, and we just end up missing all of those. Uh, to me, this sounds like the claim that there are apples out there that if you drop them, they would fall upwards. But for some reason, either by coincidence or conspiracy, we have only ever dropped the ones that fall downward. It amounts to scientific nihilism, but I do understand the instinct to want to preserve locality and value definiteness because they're both very uh, crucial uh, principles for understanding the world around us. So if you had to choose, uh, which one would you pick? Would you uh, consider the universe to be non-local, value indefinite, or super deterministic? Uh, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, we all learned something today. Um, uh, something, something, Raid Shadow Legends. And uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.